said that I am optimistic. Now, to say, make that statement at a conference on the Middle East is enough to get you sent to a, a nut house and maybe even to jail. Uh, it sounds a little bit crazy. But why shouldn't I be optimistic? Firstly, I come to Mexico and welcome uh, such wonderful people. I have colleagues who are of compatible uh, interest and perspective. And if we're not going to present a gladiatorial contest today, please don't be too disappointed. I think that there are more and more professionals and people who are following the issues who are beginning to think that there may be a way out of this terrible situation. I find myself like um, the man who wanders through the forest, doesn't know where he's going, but meets someone else, and that person says, I don't know where to go, but I can assure you that if you go in, the, in that direction, you're not gonna be going in the right direction. So I learn wrong directions from many people, and I long learn wrong directions from some of my own activities, which to some of you might seem to be folly, naive, and maybe even treasonous and outrageous. I have been working for the last six years with Palestinians and Jordanians and Israelis, trying to bring them together to work in an area of some compatibility. I came to the conclusion that blame and shame is what interferes with a lot of the efforts to make peace. So if we can find something that is threatening of compatible seriousness to all sides and is cross-border, maybe, maybe we can get something going. I believe, as my colleagues clearly stated, that it's really difficult to think that either of the governments are going to change at this point. And so most of us who are realistic see ourselves working bottom-up. But I think that working bottom-up in a certain way is also working top-down. And that's what I'm trying to do, insofar as I try to address policy in a certain area, that is, in things that threaten the lives of people. And this, by the way, is the way that I sort of crawled in to this. Um, as you know, there are anti-normalization laws. But the anti-normalization laws has a little exclusion, um, so that uh, if you're working for health issues, um, if you're working to save lives, who are that in. So, I try to save lives. And there are a lot of Israelis who are trying to save lives. And there are a lot of diaspora Jews who want to save lives. And you know what? There are Palestinians who recognize this and want to be partners with them. My message is that there is a new generation of Palestinians that has been born and that recognizes some of the folly of the past and is prepared to work with us in a very creative way. Now, why shouldn't there be? Can you study the history of Zionism without making qualifications for different generations? Was, uh, was uh, Ben Gurion like Herzl? Could you imagine Ben Gurion and Herzl sitting around the table and getting along? Ben Gurion would have said, "You should have, you should have lived another, another few months." Why should? Why would he have given that lesson? Because at that point, Herzl was thinking about. His notion of Zionism was you know, just get the Jews someplace else. He was thinking of Uganda. If he had lived another few months, he would be an example of a shameful person. Now he's the big ball of books. I'm sure that Ben Gurion would say something. Like that. The generations were always different. Our art is full of, 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 uh, of messages about how different the generation. Who would we be without the Thura the Roof? Who would we be without so many dramas that depict the different the generations? Why do we think that both the Palestinians, one generation have another generation have another generation? There is a new generation, and my operational definition, my qualifications for seeing this as, seeing these people as emerging leaders is that they give up on two things. One, that they understand that martyrdom is not the greatest experience in the world, and two, that they're, they're disengaging from the kind of of, of you know, sitting around, the world's going to take care of us, to realizing that it's a hard world out there. You know, you've got to use your ability. And when Palestinians use their ability, they have abilities. They were the brains of the Middle East. They were the ones who taught at all the universities. They were very, very good at it. 
What happened? Southeast Asians came along, and they got put in also. They were willing to put up with greater humiliation and lower salaries, so the Palestinians lost their jobs. There were other forces. You know, we think of, of, of Oslo as, a, as a, a great moment. Oslo had a very dark side to it. Imagine Americans and British coming to these questionable people who were leaders that so many Palestinians did not want to allow back to the country. We think Arafat was received unanimously by Palestinians that this is the great man. I have been to conferences with, uh, with the diaspora Palestinians where when they talk about their 10 years of working with the PLO and who Arafat was, I get embarrassed by the, by the, the true ways in which they talk about him. They talk like Molly Goldbergs. They curse him, they, they realize all of his limitations. This is the man that Oslo made into a great person. In the United Nations, they let him walk in with a gun. Who has ever heard of such horrible, horrible behavior? And this was in the name of Palestinians. So of course we're going to think they're all terrorists. Maybe there's a different a new generation that thinks differently. And maybe that generation is not so young. Maybe it's not just, you know, like Kamsamo defines it. Maybe it's you know, even up to 55 or 50 that there are people in who have gone through some of these experiences who have good qualifications. I find myself in my work in Palestine finding an unbelievable number of people from Gaza, you know, who are mentioned, who are people who understand, you know, who understand, if not liberal democracy, they understand participant democracy, because they had none of it. They had no illusions about it. I hired dozens. I can't believe it. But who knows what's behind the walls? What's in other places? We think that it's religion. I thought this was a big problem in Palestine. I got all the mullahs are going to come around for work. They're going to boycott us. And they're going to say, this man is a heretic. Why is he a heretic? Because we Muslims know that what causes earthquakes is that when women allow their hair to be exposed and when men drink beer. And this man is coming around and saying, you can be religious. He tells us that he's a rabbi, which I am. I talk of myself as an American, as a Jew, as a Zionist with a small Z. I don't know what a Zionist with a small Z is, but it's going to make a lot of people happy that it's a small Z. And, and you know, I, I speak to the religious leaders, and they're ready to come and say, well, you know, Allah wants people to save themselves also. They legitimate the work that they hired me to. I thought that I was going to have to import Muslims from, you know, Milwaukee, from Dearborn, right in Palestine. Certainly in Jordan, even in Jordan, there are chaplains that, you know, tough guys that have been in the military for 25 years, and they're not ready to put up with any of these religious distortions. And when you look back at the history of the Middle East, and you realize how much of the conflict was caused by Muslim brothers and things like that, you realize that, that, that there could be a moderate Islam, conservative and reform perhaps, that would agree about how to, you know, how to deal with the temple, how to there are all kinds of possibilities. I think our assessment has to be a realistic assessment of what's going on in the Jewish community. And here, there are real problems. I think this whole business about active society in Israel is such a great society and is thriving, notwithstanding all these horrible things. And we are going to be resilient. I cannot tell you how many times I've been off, I've been invited as a sociologist to conferences of our former military officers who used to get hired in all kinds of international jobs, but they're not getting hired anymore because Israel hasn't done so well in military things. So they want to talk about resilience. What does resilience mean? The Jewish people always were resilient, they always adjust, and we know how to deal with terrorism. An ethnic atonement. No one can know how to deal with terrorism. And to allow these people to, to, to tell us that Israel is getting ahead is Terrible. Let's listen to a man who is probably the greatest Jew, certainly in the diaspora for the second part of the 20th and first part of the 21st century, Ambassador Stu Eisenstein, who has a book called Megatrends. It has it all there. It was written 10, 15 years ago, but it points out how Israel was slipping on, on basic, basic indicators that you, know, you can measure. So, for example, 
Is there any kids? Where would they be on math and science scores? Certainly, in, if not number one, in the top five. You know where they have been the last few years? 56. Another great indicator of development, that things are going well, even if we have to spend all of our budget on, on the shtachim and on police and on, on military and bribing the uh, Palestinians to be the police that behave themselves, buying them up and thinking controlling them. Another indicator is how many past, how many uh, 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 certifications do you need from any government agency to start a pizza shop, a washroom, a lot shop, to build a building, to do anything with government. And uh, it's 56 also. Israel, let me tell you, as the father and grandfather of, of two children, of two in-laws, and uh, six grandchildren living there, is falling apart in every way, falling apart. The economy is bifurcated, the difference between the wealthy and the not so wealthy is becoming more of a cost issue, and almost every one of these things can be related to the money that is being wasted on an inefficient policy with the Palestinians. Let me make quickly just two other points. I hang around a lot with mediators, uh, uh, either at Harvard uh, Law School, where I was a I have met most of the mediators who've been involved on the Israel side of the, uh, the peace league. And they've made it clear that the territories are not the issues that this can be said. It becomes more and more difficult if you have war after war after war, there's more bitterness about it. The territorial things could be settled. Everything could be settled. Um, uh, in principle, some of the proposals made even by the Arabs have been accepted in principle. It's not going to be so easy another war with another intifada, so that's not very good. The kind of responses of PTS that uh, our, uh, some of our Jewish leaders are accepting, National Hillel now says if you talk about uh, boycott, you cannot come into a Hillel house. This is a travesty. This is, you know, this is fascists who are buying up our resources and our own leaders who are you know, the of who's the, the financial resource train kids a whole summer to do the boycott and not to ask questions, did it work in South Africa? No, it did not work in South Africa. It's not boycott that brought about the change. It was one person, Mandela, and certainly not Tutu, that made that change. We don't have a Mandela on the Palestinian side. We don't have a Mandela on the Israeli side. When we have leadership, and I'm hoping that we're going to have within five years people that you would like to have dinner with, Saturday night, not only Saturday night, on uh, Eric Shabbos, on Shabbos, uh, and they'll be able to make Kiddush also. Um, there's a great dynamic there, and we're not looking at it. We're instead playing around with inefficient tools that are just representing a smokescreen against the realities. So, yes, I am optimistic. Yes, I'm happy to be here, and I hope that this kind of thing draws us together as a community. We're not right wing, we're not left wing. We are Jews with humanitarian concerns, and guess what? We have some Palestinians that share these concerns.